Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for making it out here in the rain to Debbie's Bookshop. We're very excited to celebrate um, how to get on the podcast. I'm Michelle uh, Gogebeck, and we're here with uh, Kirk Hawkins as well. So it'll be about a 30-minute conversation, followed by a Q&A, and then we have plenty of books to purchase and sign as well. So enjoy. Thank you. Awesome. Well, welcome. Thanks for braving the rain <laughs> um, and making your travels down here. Uh, Michelle and I actually, I feel like a logical place to begin this discussion is uh, the fall of 2000 when Michelle and I first met as students at UC Santa Barbara. And we made a vow while we were working in student <laughs> leadership, basically, that one day we would replace Matt Lauer and Katie Couric as hosts of the Today Show. <laughs> And this is our that, moment. Yes. This is it. That, we are live on YouTube. Yes. That Maps clearly, aren't even replaced. That clearly but. never happened. It didn't work out that way. Um, but yeah, here we are. And it's and I, I think it's so interesting that, you know, the Today Show, NBC, broadcast television, legacy media, and now we're here pivoting, uh, talking about podcasts, a completely different medium, a completely different um you know, sector that I think in that, that time, 24-ish years ago, we may not have even envisioned this, but here we are, how to get on podcasts. And so how are you feeling after putting, you know, the book is here. How are you feeling after putting, coming, bringing it together? Now you're on your publicity tour. What, what is that all like? It's surreal. And, you know, going back to podcasts didn't even exist when you're in college. Yeah. Like Facebook existed, but we couldn't even get on it mm -hmm. because I was just graduating. I remember my brother was like, oh, I got this Facebook account. I couldn't. So to come from this full circle, this forward is really interesting. And that this podcast has been around for 20 years, but I didn't know how to even listen to one until 2018. So it's really only becoming popular in the last five, six, seven years. And so it's weird that I just kind of fell into this just as I fell into the career that I had and it's all kind of worked out beautifully and well. <laughs> and, and we know you from, you know, while you were working in school, you were working in private aviation mm -hmm. um, and then eventually you evolved. How did, how did podcasts come into your life? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I worked in corporate aviation for 18 years. I sold uh -huh. jet fuel and I, I kept the wealthy flying at cheaper rates. And then I was laid off with my second child. And by then it was my second layoff. So the first one, I worked for a company that I felt was like the creme de la creme in corporate aviation. And so the next company was like, okay, it's not the one that I would want to work for, but I'm, I'm fine with that one. And then when I was laid off with that one, because they were acquired, I felt there was nowhere to go because it was just going to be down. I didn't have the same respect for the other companies that I did. So I felt, okay, what can I do where I can be at home with my kids who were two under two? I can make a living and contribute and do something that changes the world for them. I really wanted to better the world that they were growing up in. And a woman from my birthing class from my first child said, there's this life and business coach. She's starting a podcast. You should listen. I was like, that sounds great. How do I listen to one? And I discovered the purple icon on my phone and I started listening and she said, you know, we'll have a purpose and a passion. And I thought, great, that's what I'm trying to do is find that purpose and that passion. And then she reached out to me and said, well, you keep posting about what I'm saying. So you must like it. Do you want to get me to be on other podcasts? I was like, that's a thing. Yes, please. I would love to do that. And, you know, people ask me all the time, how'd you go from 18 years in aviation selling fuel to, now, podcasts, it's the same thing because it's all relationship-based. Mm -hmm. It is all about 18 years of not loving fuel, but loving the people I worked with, mm -hmm. knowing their birthdays, knowing who was you know, having a baby, who was getting married. And that's what podcast pitching is, too. It's the relationships I have with my clients, the relationships I create with the hosts, and bringing them together and being able to say, you know, your story is really important. Let's share it. You have this education that people need to know and this knowledge. Let's share it. And by sharing it and having it be accessible to others in a free medium, then we can change the world because we're no longer alone wherever we are in our journey. We can now get free education and knowledge versus buying a course or, you know, having to read all these books or go back to school to learn how to build a business or whatever it is. These are all things that we can get on a podcast. 
And in addition to that, you can be entertained. There's crime stories, you know, who loves the true crime? It's the number one podcast genre that's out there. Mm. There's comedy ones. There's something for everyone. And that's what is so beautiful about it. So that's why I feel like I say everywhere in all of my stuff, it says um, your voice has the power to change the world because I believe that the podcasts really allow us to do that. And you started with one client mm -hmm. and then it snowballed into many Yes. Basically. <laughs> and you become, you become, I don't know if you would call it podcast publicist, but um, I podcast do. PR, yep. podcast. I mean, you, you obviously have a title, the podcast matchmaker. I um, gave that to myself. And, yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> and which is, which is spot on. And you're, I mean, it looks like one after another, your business just exploded. It continues to grow. And the type of people I work with also continues to evolve. You know, in the beginning, it was a lot of entrepreneurs or coaches, and now it's a lot of authors. I work with a ton of authors, mm -hmm. and I also work with nonprofits because, you know, for a nonprofit, and whether it's a business or a nonprofit, to have your team members share their story of why do I come to work every day? Why do I feel so passionate about what we are doing as a company? It changes how people interact with your company. Mm -hmm. It allows them to, you know, it resonates. Oh, maybe I should get involved with this nonprofit. Maybe I should become a donor for this nonprofit. And we've seen that. I've seen that with the companies I've worked with. So it, it continues to evolve in who I work with. And then the Rolodex of who my contacts are continues to evolve. So yeah, it, it grows and grows and it, it's great. It's, it's incredible. And, you know, now we're in this world where, there's Facebook, there's Twitter, there's Instagram, there's TikTok, LinkedIn. There's threads. a need to threads. <laughs> I know I completely, and there's a couple of others that I follow, but I'm blanking on them too. Mastodon, but they're Mastodon, social, yeah. <laughs> a couple of like yeah. in the wake of Twitter and the X madness, there were a couple of others that formed too. Uh, so there's, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're, uh, if you own a business, if you're just a professional, in order to stay relevant, you need to be constantly posting. So I would think that as an entrepreneur or a business utilizing podcasts, you have um, the ability to, to basically, you do an interview, you chop up the interview and you have clips that you can start posting and there's at least one source of content. And if it's done by an interviewer, it's this you know relevant source of content. So it, I feel like in terms of marketing, it's a huge opportunity yeah. that, that you're obviously matchmaking people for. We call it repurposing your content. And so it is taking this 30 minute episode, 60 minutes, whatever it is, and creating these smaller chunks out of it, downloading a transcript, taking that transcript and looking at all of the quotes that you said, because I know that for a long time on my Instagram, I was quoting Oprah because Oprah had something good to say. And then I realized, wait, I'm doing all these interviews. I must be saying something good too. So let me start quoting myself. And that's how we become these thought leaders of the experts in our industry and what we know. And it's by promoting ourselves, but doing it in a way where it doesn't feel gross and like, look at me, I'm amazing and I know everything, but instead a, let me educate you on what I know and share what I know. So that way I can help you. And it's being, to me, it's more generous in being in, in your sharing of your knowledge mm -hmm. than it is in trying to be a salesperson or self-promotion because I know those are gross words. Well, it, it's interesting because those are two things that I absolutely want to get into because so, so the book itself, uh, just to cheat here for a second, it's like 173 pages. And that's the arc. So and, it might be different from the, the oh, real one. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So it's, it's more than a hundred, roughly 170 pages. Mm -hmm. It's an easy read and it's, you give us everything that we possibly need to do to get started. And one of the things that you talk about in the book is how important it is to have that mindset when you're putting a podcast together, you're building content is to, you call them like have your freebies in a way ready, mm. but you, cause I was going to say you give like, we don't need to hire you as the podcast matchmaker now <laughs> that's because we think. have, <laughs> because we have the book. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that was really my intent with the book was to allow anyone to go out and pitch themselves mm. to create your speaking topics it is the intent to create a standard in the podcasting industry because we have no standards. Mm -hmm. It's been around for 20 years, but it's the wild, wild west. Anyone can have a show. Anyone can be interviewed. You can just do it. You yeah. show up, but it, you should have a mic. You should have headphones. There are all of these things you should be doing, 
but not everybody's doing it. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like with the book, there's now this set of standards of let's make this the acceptable way to pitch yourself. Mm -hmm. Let's demand that these are the standards. I hear from hosts. I, I posted last week that there was an article in Inc. that was like the best practices of being a podcast guest. And it stopped at the recording. Mm -hmm. And I posted, well, how it doesn't stop at the recording. You have to then share your interview. You have to thank the host. You have to repurpose this because I get asked all the time, what's my ROI on an interview? Mm -hmm. Well, if you're not sharing it, then you shouldn't expect any ROI. Right. And the responses I got were, well, as a host, you know, so many guests don't even share and I just can't stand it. And then it came out that Dax Shepard also commented last week that his celebrity guests are not sharing his interviews. And I said, well, if Dax has that problem, then it's no wonder the rest <laughs> of us do, you know? Yeah. Um, but then it goes along today. I actually posted that, you know, forget the, the guest part. How about the hosts who aren't telling the guest when their interview goes live? Yeah. I had four go live last week. Two didn't even tell me but I have Google alerts and talk walker alerts set on my name. So that told me you've been mentioned on a podcast. If I hadn't known those, then I wouldn't know that these things have gone live. Mm -hmm. So we need these standards. And that's what I want the book to show is this is the right way to do it. If we want this industry to be professional and to give our knowledge and everything away, because just because I wrote the book doesn't mean that everyone wants to go do this by themselves. Mm -hmm. It takes work. It takes time. And so people will still want to hire me, which I feel is, you know, it's fine. Whether read the book, I get royalties, right? I'm like, I'm not going to be selfish about it. That's yeah, a win-win yeah. for me. But I, I would, in the book, I think I say that in the beginning of starting my business, I listened to Amy Porterfield on a podcast and she said, give as much as you can away for free because people who listen will say, if this is what she gives away for free, imagine what she's going to give me if I pay her. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I give as much as I can away for free. You can replicate it all you want. But just as we all have similar stories, sometimes they're all unique because each one of us is unique. So the way I'm going to approach my business is going to be unique from the way you might pitch somebody. Right. So that is why I've given it all away. No, I, <laughs> and, and we thank you for it and appreciate it. Well, uh, one of the things that I love, and this is just from the very beginning, there's a couple of, there's two aspects rather than going step by step, you have to read the book for the step by step, but you begin and you talk a lot about um, your why and your purpose for why you're doing this, which I think is beautiful and amazing. But, um, and there's an important aspect of that where that's where you want all of your clients to kind of begin their podcasting journey, so to speak. It's like, what, what is your why? Why are you, what is the reason for doing this? And um, really kind of delving into that so that they actually have something to pitch themselves about, too. And at least it seems like that's where the discussion starts, or at least how you want people to kind of jump off when they, when they start the process. It does, because even with my clients, we're not pitching your product, your book, or your service. We're pitching you, the person. Mm -hmm. No host is going to interview your book. So for you to pitch your book of, look, here's my book. It's how to get on podcasts. The host doesn't have questions for the book. They have questions for me. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important that you figure out what is your story? Why do you want to be known? What do you want to be known for? What's your journey look like to create these pivots and bring you to where you are today? Mm -hmm. And that's where you have to start in order to figure out what your speaking topics are and then to be able to pitch yourself to the right audience. Because mm -hmm. if you don't know any of this, then you, you can't pitch yourself. Oh, yeah. And there's an important part of that practice and, and going through that exercise is uh, not feeling bad about self-promotion. Mm -hmm. And I think I've experienced it in social media when I'm promoting not only my, the TV side of my life, but also the real estate side of my life where I, I feel uncomfortable um, celebrating wins. Like I closed this amount of properties or, you know, I won this award on television. And But you really, in order to still be part of the conversation. You need to do these things. It's, it's super important. And so in the book, you spend a considerable amount of time kind of reminding us over and over self-promotion, self-promotion, self-promotion. Why, why do you think that is so important? It allows for people who are watching you to know that it's possible. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not, 
self promotion it's so it's got a negative connotation right. you know for for you to say oh I, I don't want to say that i won this award well you should you should be proud of it you've worked hard to get to where you are and for people who are following you and watching you we want to celebrate with you too mm -hmm. i think it's really important to allow others to see what your journey's been like how you've gotten to where you are and then for us to be able to celebrate you and to know that for us as well that we can do that too you know, I can be that kid from UC Santa Barbara too and be stand, sitting up here with you, the Mr. KTLA, you know, and have these conversations. So I think it's really important that we share that knowledge. And I mentioned in the book that one of my clients had said to me, you know, all of these interviews have gone live and it just so happened to be the same week that Roe v. Wade was reversed. And, you know, we all remember those years. And she was like, I, I can't. I can't share this comfortably. I don't feel like I should be telling people that I've made these pivots and this is what I'm doing. And I reminded her that we're in a time where we also need positivity. Yeah. We are so down in the dumps with the media and what we see going on in the world. So for us to listen to her story and hers was a lot of burnout at work. And, you know, how do I, as a manager, how do I talk to, um, you know, my team and how do I make sure that they aren't going to burn out? And so to take all of those stories and turn them into a positive of look at what you can do, especially in a time when life just sucks. Yeah. Here are some ways that you can do it. You have to share it. Mm -hmm. You owe it to the people that are following you to share that information and that knowledge so that they can go and do something positive in their lives as well. So that's why I feel like it's so important to share the wins, the knowledge, the, you know, this is how I did it kind of stories. Oh, absolutely. And it's interesting. You, um, you become, we talk about thought leaders and, and y when you think of someone who might be a thought leader or an expert in one way, you have kind of this idea in your mind of who that person is and, you know, were they published by the New York times? Were they interviewed on, you know, by the wall street journal, or do they speak to Bloomberg at a regular basis? And it's not that sophisticated. It's like, you could be, you know, pitch yourself to 10 of these different podcasts and okay, now you're a thought leader because you've done these interviews and there's an easier way to kind of elevate yourself than having to make that huge jump. And so I feel like, um, it's, it's a great way to kind of build your business or build awareness around, you know, spreading your, the awareness of your why too. It seems. It like. also allows you to write the to reach the right people, you know, just because maybe I go on KTLA tomorrow and there's a 30 second spot on me or well, all of the people who are watching at 10 in the morning, really those who want to get on podcasts right. or would I be better off going on a podcast and talking for 30 to 60 minutes to the audience who all wants to know, how do I get on podcasts? I'm much better over there than I am Although it's nice to be on KTLA, that's just my yeah, example. Yeah. No, but <laughs> if you want to have me on tomorrow, I'll change my flight. But <laughs> you know, it, it's reaching that right audience, and so then that goes into the size of the podcast. Yeah. And you know, do I have to be on the one with a hundred thousand yes. listeners? No, because that might not be your ideal audience. They might not care at all about what you have to say. Well, and and, and that was it. You you bring that up in the book because people look at reviews and they want to pick a podcast based on reviews in some cases. Mm -hmm. And even though I think that's so interesting because the amount of reviews you have doesn't necessarily get the amount of co correlate to the plays or li listens that they, they would have too. And it would think, I would think that, um, and any interview is a good interview and it might not necessarily matter how many, I mean, obviously you want as many listeners to tune in as possible, but especially as you're getting started, it might not necessarily, it might not necessarily matter too. And like, so I guess it's a two-part question. Maybe it doesn't matter, but then how do you also determine metrics and and what is a valuable podcast to, to pitch yourself to? So I think when we talk about numbers, you know, especially those starting out on the guest side, I've had clients who say, well, I have no social media following. Nobody's going to want to talk to me. Mm -hmm. It's not about your numbers. It's about your story and what you have to say. So forget about your numbers, have a presence somewhere because we want you to share those interviews. So show up somewhere, somewhere that you like and somewhere that you can attract the people mm -hmm. that you want to talk to. But then when we talk about the metrics on the podcasting side, there are reviews. But if you look at Apple, that's only for people who have an iPhone. If you don't have an iPhone, you can't leave a review. Right. Spotify has a rating system. Podchaser has a rating <laughs> system. But 
just as with Instagram, where you can buy followers, you can now buy a podcast promoter who's giving you extra downloads or giving you extra reviews. So it's, it's completely a mess. And that's why I look at in the template that you get um, in there is to look at all of these numbers, look at every number that there is. And if you really want to go deep, then go look at their Instagram. And if they have 100,000 followers, well, how many likes are they getting? Mm-hmm. Who's engaging with them? Is it 100,000 people that they bought and only five people are real? It's the same thing with the podcast, you know, and are they sharing the podcast and are people engaging with that? So if you really want to get into it, you have to look at the entire picture and not just the reviews or even the downloads. I know that Apple just last week oh, yeah. kiboshed the, the whole promo- promotion part because there were people going out, you would hire them and they would get extra downloads for you. Well, all of a sudden, all of these downloads just tanked in the last week. Oh, wow. And it's because they figured out, oh, <clears throat> this probably isn't a good thing because they're fake numbers. So now you see a lot of these dips going down. And we saw some when there was an iOS update and people were worried, you know, I'm, I'm losing my listeners. Well, no, it's because it wasn't updating properly. So there's just a lot that goes into it to figure out what is the best metric, you know, to be looking at. I say, look at who the host is talking to, read the description of the show, who is their target audience and does that align with yours? And that's really what's the most important, whether it's small or big, big's always great. Yes. But make sure that it aligns with who you want to reach. And you're really underscoring the point uh, that you also talk about along the path is you really have to do your research. Mm -hmm. You look into who the podcast host is, as you were mentioning, look, find out, you know, what kind of comments, what kind of likes, what kind of followers they have and if they're real or not. And, um, and, and this all goes into just the work that it takes to pitch someone and you want to pitch very specifically based on, you know, and I like how you said you casually mentioned, Oh, when I was listening to your podcast the other day, you mentioned, so this isn't something that you can kind of, you really have to put some time and effort and be really, really thorough as you're developing your pitch and specifically reaching out to people too. You should, there is no copy and paste in PR and podcast pitching is a form of PR. There is a small part and you see that in the book where it's called a skeleton pitch where there's a two or three sentence about you because you're not gonna change, your background's not gonna change. You may copy and paste that, that is fine. But when you reach out to the host, you're going to say, hi Kirk, you know what? I saw you on KTLA last week and your weather report was wrong, but um, <laughs> I really enjoyed happened. the dance that you did and with the makeup artist and right away he's going to go, oh, she did actually watch yeah. me. And you can tell I did. I watched, Yes, I watched. Um, but to connect with the host on that level where it's personal and they know that I couldn't send that same email to you because you're not on KTLA doing a dance, but you are. So it's really getting personal, looking at their website. I landed an interview, not just for a client, but for myself too. And that's in the book that I read her website and she said, I have Irish twins. I love wine and my husband drinks whiskey. And I went, oh my gosh, it's like talking to myself. I read your website and you are me and I am you. And she goes, well, then let's have an interview. Because she saw that I made that extra effort to actually read her bio. Mm -hmm. It was as simple as that. And it's just taking those small steps and and just implementing them, getting personal. And I we haven't even talked about this part yet, but the entire book's related to a dinner party. No, that, that was actually my <laughs> next. No, go for it. I'll just take over from here. No, no. <laughs> we would have worked great together. <laughs> we still can. Yeah, that could be another it's morning show. Yeah. Um, th- the whole thing is related to a dinner party because I love dinner parties, and the podcast host is your dinner host. They're inviting you into their home, which is their show. So how do you show up and engage in a conversation where you are present with them? You are not distracted by the emails on, you know, your computer. I've had people clicky clacking on an interview. You can hear it. I know you're not fully present to actually, you know, have done your homework and talk to each other. You know, you obviously have read the book. You come prepared. I have had guests who have also come prepared that I was completely surprised by. I listened to your episode in which you mentioned this and I thought this and I went, oh, I didn't expect you to. You should, but I didn't expect it. And then to then take that dinner party and how do you say thank you after dinner? 
Do you write them a, a text in the morning and say, that was a great party? Do you write them a handwritten thank you card, which we should all do again, because yeah. I love that. You know, <laughs> did you show up with flowers or a bottle of wine? That's your freebie that you're giving to everybody later, your tips. Do you say thank you? The way you say thank you is by repurposing the interview later, not for 24 hours in your Instagram stories, because that's lazy, but actually putting it up on your website, putting it inside all of your feeds, tagging the host. And that's how you're going to see the ROI, the ripple effect, the, how you're going to reach not just your audience, but now again to your audience. And now you're going to keep tagging and it can go back and forth. And with all the algorithms, nobody's going to see it 50 times. It's always going to be someone new who's seeing it. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to that self-promotion thing. Yes. Just do it. Don't think about it. Just post about it. Don't don't even hesitate. <laughs> and it's not self-promotion if I'm thanking the host. Right. You know, to, right. For me to go, it'll Look, make you feel. It this person had the, me on. The nerves and yes. yeah, absolutely. And it's my duty to thank you for inviting me into your home. So mm -hmm. I have to let you all know that Kirk was a great host. So I'm thanking you, and I'm going to tag you, and then you're going to say, "Oh, well, you were a great guest, so I'm going to tag you too." And that's how it's done. And it's just like a dinner party. There's nothing self-promotion about it. It's just the nice way to do things. The dinner party is a really interesting part of the book. You also talk about a chance meeting with um, Richard Branson. My, my friend, <laughs> Which Richard. I'm not surprised. <laughs> that, and, and, many, and there's many others. Um, but like it, it, it's neat how you were able to kind of weave that all throughout uh, throughout the uh, our, our the Bible, so to speak. Here, the Bible, <laughs> the Bible podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I guess one question I had too is, I, I we might be and getting close to our time. I don't want to like get in trouble, but the Zibby's people. Okay, um, the the one question I had is, everyone has a podcast now, and like you said, every possible niche every subject you can possibly think of. Uh, do you think we're ever going to hit critical mass? Will it become a world where people, you know, people won't engage with podcasts is like kind of what is the state of podcasts and where's the future going? Do you think? We have not hit the top okay. during COVID. We saw it was, it went like this because mm -hmm. COVID brought everybody home. So we had people who no longer knew how to listen to their shows. I don't have a commute anymore. I'm not working out. How do I listen to oh. my shows? How do I make that time? They were figuring that out. Then we had hosts who um, were in studios who now couldn't be in the studio and they were at home. And how do I now do that show? And so as everybody figured it out, then it creeped back up. And then we had people go, oh, well, I'm at home now. I can do a podcast too. So we saw a huge influx in podcasts that were created. We've seen it come down again now that we're all back to so what normal life. But what we find is that podcasts take time, money, and consistency. And that's what really weeds a lot of people out who are not willing to put all of that forth. A 30-minute episode takes, on average, four hours to produce. If you have an editor, you're doing your show notes, you're doing your social media, you're doing all of this. And four hours a week is a lot of time for a 30 minute episode and for one person to do it on their own. Mm -hmm. But those who really want to do it are going to stick with it and do it. And so you see those people who are continuing to do that. And I think we'll see more. I think that we've seen that th there's trust built in podcasts. Um, I, I was just doing my newsletter this afternoon and ACAST released a study in October of 2023 that said that 75% of people go to podcasts to get endorsements for whatever product service that they want because they trust the host. And I think that comes down to the fact that for me, for example, I don't have a sponsor. I don't do ads. It's my show. Mm -hmm. I get to say what I want. I get to tell you that I really love this book. I really love this product. I don't have to lie about it. I, I won't tell you what I hate because I don't think that's cool, but I will tell you what I love. And so if you trust me in the sense that I'm going to be honest about what I believe in, what I enjoy, what has worked for me, then you're going to be more apt to go purchase that as well. Mm -hmm. And that's what people are seeing. That's what advertisers are seeing. Advertising dollars are in the billions in podcasts, and that's only going up by a billion each year. So I don't think it's tapped out. I think there's still a long way to go. I think that we're going to see, especially this year, more on the politics side. Mm -hmm. um, that For better or worse. 
<laughs> we'll hear from some we want to hear from and probably <laughs> right. some that we don't want to hear from. Right. Um, but but we'll hear more because people are realizing that podcasts are a, an avenue to get to others. We are listening. On average, you know, most Americans are listening from 12 years old on up. They're listening to podcasts. So you're going to see more and more coming of it. And, and I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. And to follow up on another thing that you mentioned, consistency is so important. Yes. And it seems like with all things marketing, with all things social media in particular, because the you're able to kind of work the al algorithm to your favor if you if you stick with consistency. And so the people that have the discipline and the focus to you know continue to produce or continue to pitch are the ones that seem to really really excel in this space too. And all it takes is a process, you know, to to have your steps written out. So if you want to hire someone to do it for you, they can come in and do it. The Trello board template has literally a checklist so that you know when an episode has gone live. Okay, well, I need to post it on my website. Check. I need to post it on Facebook. Check. Post in all these places so the process is done for you. Mm -hmm. And if you get templates that are already branded to you, you know, there's actually templates in the book that you have access to that you can then put in your own branding with your font and your colors then that's done for you too. And so really it's changing out, you know, the title and the podcast cover art and now you're done. So my whole goal in basically everything I do is to make it simple, make it easy. And if it can be a repeatable process, then put the process in place so that you can easily swap things out and just get it done. The, the, a, a repeatable system, it seems yes. like. Yeah. Uh, the, one thing too, with the growth of podcasts, Initially, they were just recorded audio podcasts, and now you're seeing so many more video podcasts, or they are able to accom accomplish both. So what I like in the book is you give some tips and some reminders, maybe in a way, of the importance of being prepared to be on camera. Yes. And that goes for you know how you dress, how you look, how you kind of carry yourself, and to not forget all of those things, because it can have an impact on basically whether or not you'd want to share the content later. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, it can be as simple as was your hair touching your collar and you kept moving oh, yeah. your earrings. And I, I've been on the other end where when I was producing podcasts where you could literally hear the guest every time she moved, her hair was going into yeah. the microphone. So just paying attention to those little things, you know, do you need dangly earrings? No, you're, you should be wearing a headset. So you shouldn't need the pretty earrings anyway. But making sure that you're you're just simply prepared, you know, if it even if it isn't video, but you're seeing each other, mm -hmm. then don't look like you rolled out of bed. You yeah. know, make sure you put forth some sort of an effort. Yeah. Um, and I go into like colors and, you know, what looks good and don't wear I know, too I was many surprised stripes. That consultants in television news always say jewel tones. And I don't know. You you mentioned different types of colors. Yes. I feel like not yeah. jewel tones, but like. I'm I did some research on it. On it. There was like yeah. some warm tones and so yes. yeah. Yes. And I was, so I thought that was uh, that was definitely an In aha. Style magazine helped on that oh, one. Good. Yeah, okay. I, I quoted them. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. I didn't mention I didn't double check the acknowledgement. So it makes <laughs> sense. Um no, and I thought that was I thought that was a really really important and great tip too. Is there anything I, I we can probably ask for a Q&A at this point. Is there anything that I didn't ask you that you want to point out? I don't think so. I, I try pretty to end, thorough. You're oh, good. good. Okay. Yeah. I try to end every interview with that question. Well, thank so, you. Yeah. yeah. I do have to say hello to Declan and Catherine before yes. I forget that part or <laughs> I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and we can obviously pick up the book here tonight. Yes. It, any any other information and you and you're going to be signing here today too yes okay. i will sign them all i will personalize and we can them listen to your podcast anywhere podcasts are available yes my simplified life and i think you know i'm going to turn this one into i'm going to ask for that later i'm going to turn this into an episode so <laughs> good that way everybody can we all have the content. ripple effect yeah, yes yeah. yes no great so does anyone have any questions no question I'll ask a question. Sure. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us and your and your positive uh, outlook on sharing, being, um, you know, and, and highlighting the exuberance as opposed to the negative. And I love that as a life uh, outlook. So thank you, and for the interview. Um, I am an author as well, and um, a first time author. And I had this whole vision of being, you know writing a blog and doing a podcast and the whole rigor roll and got completely overwhelmed at one podcast up on my site and that's it and so I wanted to ask you 
in terms of scaling up um, and maybe being on other people's podcasts is a lot more approachable and smart rather than starting at one oneself and uh, like it just to get some wings. And then the second part of that question is in doing a podcast, publishing one, what is the like minimum length of the thing? Because of course it'll be easier to do a podcast that's five minutes long. Sure. <laughs> and uh, if you just have some advice for a newbie like myself. Yes. So let's see, we'll start with, th there's pros and cons to hosting versus guesting as with anything. But to start your own show, you need to find your audience. So you're going in cold versus if you guest on someone else's, you already have a warm audience that you're talking to. So you're already 10 steps ahead in that sense. You don't have to go find those people and bring them to you. By talking to the warm audience, you can also then at the end of every single um, interview, just as Kirk did, where can people find you? Where can they, you know, what can they do? That's when you then get to bring them into your circle and get them into your newsletter to, to bring them into you to get more interested. So that's the pros of not hosting your own show. You can, if you want to, you know, when we say consistency, it doesn't have to be every single week. As long as you're consistent in whatever you do, if you do one show a month and you're consistent with it, then you're consistent. And the people who are listening know that once a month on this day, every Tuesday, you know, the first Tuesday of the month, let's say, they know that they can get an inner, uh, an episode from you, then that's perfect. As long as you consistently show up on that Tuesday. Um, in terms of time, make it less than an hour. Um, the sweet spot is 20 to 30 minutes. That's where people will continue to listen. I love a short, I, when I do my solos, I try to keep it under 15 because I know it's short and quick. Interviews, I keep under 30. So it, you can keep that as a rule of thumb, but less than 30 minutes always. And if you're you know, on your own, then make it 10, 15 minutes and people will listen to the whole thing. Yeah. I, I noticed that with your podcast, you have kind of a range of a range of time. So it's good, good to clarify that. What's also good about the book is you talk, you get really specific on the type of equipment to purchase if mm -hmm. you want to host. Uh, what do you think of, and, I mean, we're in LA and so there are podcast hosts all over the place that you can rent for by the hour. Yeah. Do you think it's better to buy the equipment or to, to do one of those situations it's much more cost effective to just buy a microphone That's and a true. headset um you have and a to ring like light. set it up and take it down and test it in that case but like yes but once it's yeah. done it's done you sure. know once your settings on your microphone are where you want them to be mm -hmm. then you're done mm -hmm. like i have mine on the floor i pick it up i put it on my desk i record i put it back on the floor mm -hmm. it's it's that simple I, it's nothing more than that um, if you want to go professional with video and whatnot, I was at a studio two weeks ago and, you know, all the bells and whistles, but is it necessary? I don't think so. Mm. You know, yeah. if you want to have something in the background, like the cover of your book, then order a poster board mm. and put it back there. It's 25 bucks. Yeah. Order, you know, a, a pull-up banner. That's not $25. That's, thank you, Ted, for the banner. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I was going to say, we have to give him a, yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Yes. Husband Ted, yes. <laughs> you mentioned that podcasts are going into politics. Mm -hmm. Who fact checks podcasts? Nobody. That's the wild, that's wild the west. Thing. That yeah. is, yes. And anything that you're interested in, yeah, politically is available, which so is also no one regulates or fact checks no. any podcast. Mm -hmm. No. This is why there was some hot water with the FTC because there are some hosts. <laughs> who are charging guests to be on their show. Anywhere from, I've seen it from $25, which is silly, up to $10,000. Um, I never recommend you pay for a podcast, even if it's only $25. I don't know why you would charge $25 because editing is more than $25. So I'm not sure why you would charge something so yeah. little. If you are charging someone to be on your show, that is an advertisement. That is not PR. That is... Now it's an ad. So you need to clarify that to your viewers, to your listeners, just as you would on television, that this is a paid advertisement with, by this guest. Some of these hosts are not doing that. And so in that case, the FTC is getting involved and they're not happy about it because that's not okay. Um, so don't pay for a podcast ever. So they're paying to listen or they're paying no, to be on it? to be on it. 
do they do they usually have more listeners or downloads or are, is it kind of running the, so they say okay yes interesting um one of the things that i also wanted i mean does i don't want to interrupt the flow of questions so but one of the, from a pr perspective when you're working with a client on not only pitching but then you're about to go to the studio or you're going to record the podcast do you do, you know, like PR people are really good at talking points. Mm -hmm. Do you kind of go, I, we kind of went into that in the book a little, we, you went into that in the book. <laughs> Thank you for co-authoring, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you went into that a little bit in the book. How effective do you think that would be? You know, because if you think if you're a brand, if you're a, an entrepreneur, if you have a business going into an interview, at least having an idea of some of the things that you want to get across, you know, a rough rough I mean that's you kind of go into the importance of that is what I'm trying to you say. should yeah. yeah and I even recommend that if you can't remember certain things that you want to talk about write on a post-it and put it on your monitor oh yeah um from a PR perspective cue I've, cards. yes or cue cards <laughs> wish somebody brought some tonight but that's okay I'm just kidding <laughs> I said we wing it <laughs> um from a PR perspective you know that I I've gone to the studio with a client and you know it's my job to go um mark that out she, like what, what was just said we, we can't have go live oh yeah that's my job when i'm not present for an interview if it's a really big interview which this one was then i i flew down to la i was present for this one um and and that would be my job of not to make sure that your talking points were gotten across but to make sure that if you said something that shouldn't have been said we got that removed mm -hmm. um God, yeah. I would not want to be on the, if you're mad, I would not want you to be mad at me in that situation. So. Oh no, I wasn't mad. Right. I was just I mean, like, um, do you realize you said law. that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't want to be on that side. <laughs> Any other? Uh, um, as a writer, you know, writing different uh, types of industries, what do you, what types of podcasts would you, you know, recommend is it just more your personal story as opposed to the types of writing you do or it well so it depends kind of on the book you know if you're writing like a non-fiction book then i can go on literary podcasts i can go on podcasts about podcasts i can go on entrepreneur podcasts i can go on different ones you know because of my non-fiction book if you have a novel and i have a lot of clients that have novels we talk a little bit about the book and might create some topics around the book, but then I also want to know about what parts of them are in the book. What's the writing process like? So who is it that we're trying to reach that's going to read your book? I have authors who come to me and say, you know, I want to be on all the literary podcasts. Well, are they all going to read your beach read? No. So, you know, what's the point? Are you doing other, are you giving courses or writing lessons? You know, then yes let's get on some literary podcasts. And so we're going to have some topics that are based on your writing and what you teach and, and that sort of a thing. But we want to work towards getting to the people who are going to buy your book. So identifying what type of readers they are, you know, is it a beach read where women who are 35 and are sitting on the beach are going to want this? Well, what shows are they listening to? Is it the mom crowd? You know, is it the, the younger crowd? Is it the midlife crowd? And we identify all of those people and then work on the topics for that. Um, pulling characters from the book of, well, you know, how'd you come up with them? Or was there a certain characteristic or trait about that character? You know, was it that they were a Jewish character? And that's throughout your thread of the book. Uh, so we go for some Jewish podcasts. Was it that it's based on feminism or there's intergenerational friendships, you know, as a topic? So we look at all of those things that are within the book and who you're trying to reach and what your ultimate goal is as an author. And then we approach the podcasts. Does that help? <laughs> what, what I liked about in the book is you talk about the art of the follow-up. And mm -hmm. you know how a lot of times, and, and I think in many different industries, you'll say just following up, sending an email, that's the subject line. But you had an important reminder that you don't do that and find a more creative way to do it. And it, it was interesting because it brought up, I think it was a self-help podcast that I was listening to. And the speaker was taught, not self-help, it was like an entrepreneurial business consulting kind of. And she talked about how like, if you meet a potential client 
and through the course of your conversation, they say that they're a huge Lakers fan, for example. When you follow up with them, send them a link or like a little teaser to this, like do a Google News search if you're not aware of what the development is. Send them, be like, hey, I don't know if you saw that. And it's a very subtle way to follow up. To and radar. I felt like, and and I'm not, that <laughs> you had some some interesting ideas too about, so you've, so you've determined what the podcasts are that you would pitch. And now you're trying to get the attention of the host to book you and have you on. And that, I felt like that was a cool reminder as like a, a nice way to follow up and, and, you know, not just say moving to the top of your inbox or something. Polite persistence polite is persistence. what I've been called. Self-promotion and politely persistence <laughs> are some of the buzzwords. And I include some follow-ups that I've gotten where literally the word Bing was used. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know how that's a follow-up, but that was how they followed up with me. It got put into the book. That's... And I was curious, <laughs> were they meaning Bing the search engine or were, were they? I think it was like Bing, was... like your email used to go ding, oh, Bing, okay, okay. I think. I don't I don't know. Okay. I never checked in with them based yeah, on Yeah, that was Bing. a turnoff. <laughs> uh, yes. But, you know, bumping this up to the top of your inbox. We all have jobs. Podcast host, majority, I would say over 90%. This is not a full-time job. We all have actual full-time jobs on top of having families and whatever other responsibilities we have. So if we don't answer within a certain amount of time, you know, maybe we do need a follow-up, a gentle one, but give it a week or two because we might also be looking you up and stalking you like we should. Did you share your last interview? I'm checking up to see on that one. So, you know, that kind of a thing. Don't do it within 24 hours because it's not fast breaking news like he does. You know, it's, it's totally different. So being polite about it, you know, and not being weird about it either. Sure, sure. I have a question. Um, so with regard to, you can listen to a lot of these podcasts on Apple. Mm -hmm. But what about, I actually listen to almost everything on YouTube. Are those shows considered podcasts? Like, for instance, The School of Greatness. Yes. So he'll also have a podcast yes. and a YouTube show. Lewis, right? Lewis he's Alex. one of my he's yeah. one of my favorites. Yeah. Yeah. For instance, and I it, but I watch all of them on YouTube, and I don't know if it's better to have the visual. It's really up to the host, and more podcasts are bringing in the video portion. Yeah. Google Podcasts is going away, and it's going to be YouTube podcasts. Mm -hmm. So they're pivoting more towards the video as well, which is why it's important to be camera prepared. ready because you don't know if it is going to be on YouTube. I have my show on YouTube, but I just have a static cover art on it. Right. I don't release it. Right. So most shows, because when you launch a podcast, it's called an RSS feed, a real simple syndication. So I use Libsyn as my host. They host the actual MP3 file. Then it connects to all of the different platforms, Amazon, uh, Spotify, Google, YouTube, um, Apple, it connects to all of them automatically. The, it's called the, it's the host, your podcast host, which has a RSS feed, real simple syndication. And so when you upload it just this one time, it then feeds it to all of these other listening platforms, including YouTube. So you don't have to have any video associated with it. It'll just feed it. What was, oh, sorry. And, and my second question was, um, being unfamiliar with the world of podcasts, I understand that Joe Rogan's is like number one. Yeah. And um, so he popped up on my Instagram today. And I was just wondering, how did he get to be so famous? Because he's so controversial. He um, actually just ended, he had an exclusive with Spotify and just ended that. Oh, did he really? Yes. He went to Apple. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. Apple. yeah. So that's, a, it's another trend that we're seeing of exclusivity and, is it here to stay? Is it not? And, you know, Brene Brown, we, she had her exclusive and there was the pause with during COVID and everything. So it, it comes and goes and, you know, is it worth it being exclusive? Well, if you're Joe Rogan, you get a lot of money for it, then yeah, why not? But. Well, it was really similar to when Howard Stern signed on with Sirius XM mm -hmm. because there was so much money attached to that too. But yeah. And did what, you hear what, when he went during when so Howard Stern during COVID, uh -huh. when it COVID hit, he had to leave the studio and he sounded like he was in a tin can at home yes. until they figured that one it out. It was awful. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, you, you, 
you brought up a good point and you were kind of answering what also you kind of detail in the book about how, and, and you get like really granular and it's really helpful, a step-by-step of, you know, if you're going to do a podcast, this is the microphone, this is the equipment, these are the websites, and this is where you can go and listen to them. And so it's cool because you do, you really lay out the step-by-step guide completely. Uh, but I thought it was, I think it's really interesting how you initially was audio. Now you have the video component and um, you look at like you Spotify is trying to get more market share potentially. And so even when you're going to go find an audio podcast, you'll see the video playing right in your mm-hmm. app essentially. And um, it's interesting how the video is becoming much more of a, a part of it too. It is, which kind of makes me sad because <laughs> I feel like podcasts are the listening platform. Yeah, yeah. So if we're now looking at it and it's not, Quite a podcast, right? You, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it makes me personally a little sad. <laughs> it is, and to edit it as and then well. You need lighting and a camera and editing, and yeah. And and fully dressed or Well, you should, but of course there are no standards, so we don't well, know. Well, depending on what podcast you have. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Right. And you brought up a good point that would actually apply to you is throughout the book every chapter has behind the scenes what the host is doing from the moment they launch to having you as a guest and then afterwards. So whether you're the host or the guest, you see exactly what the host is doing and what the host does to set up the show from equipment to repurposing and their entire process as well. You mean do that as a form of content to post or? Yeah. So in every chapter has, you know, so you're oh. putting together your topics Well, they're setting up their show. So they're getting their RSS feed lined up. They're naming their show. They're creating their cover art. And it gives you the step-by-step of what the host is doing as well. So really, it's like a guide for a host if you wanted to do your own show too. Mm-hmm. Your, oh, can I just quickly ask, the RRS feed, mm-hmm. that goes to YouTube too? Mm-hmm. Oh, it does. Okay. You just connect it all. The, the most complicated one is Apple because you have to actually log in to the Apple site with your credentials, you submit your first three episodes and they actually approve it. And then once they approve it, the whole show can go live. Whereas the others, you just kind of connect it. If you have a login, whatever it is, it's much easier. Apple's the only one that has an extra step. Are are there platforms that you can upload the file to and then they feed them out? That's what this is, the host, yeah. So there's Libsyn, there's Acast, there's there's a whole. Ton of them. I mentioned them in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a bunch. And how how does one find out about the different podcasts? Mostly just you search them. So on, on, on you can search them on the Apple. You can search them on Spotify. You can just do a Google search and add in the word podcast. Um, I also search using hashtags on Instagram because they're promoting them there. If you go on Apple, then and you find one that you like scroll to the bottom and it says more like that one. And then you can go find some more like that one. And then from there you you keep going. So it becomes a rabbit hole. But if you just start putting in keywords into any of those search engines, they'll, they'll come up. Yeah. Was there, maybe that was that there's an app or a website that I feel like you mentioned in the book. That's a good, also a good starting point too. Pod Chaser. Yes. That's free. Okay. And then you can look at listennotes.com, which will tell you the global ranking of a show. And that's based on the consistency of them putting out episodes um, and people listening. Jay's show is another one that's gotten garnered so much attention. Yeah. yeah. But then that's just kind of through a regular, you know, press, like, you know, being in magazines and, you know, but he just came out of nowhere and was huge so fast. With all of his other social marketing too. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, he's been backed by a lot of uh, a mega marketing campaign. It seems like. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious why you use Libsyn as your host, and what should I look out for in a host? So I've been using Libsyn since I started in. I launched my show in 2019, um, and at the time, and I still believe this, they they had great customer service for me. I reach out to any of their VPs and they actually respond. Uh, They will be on the phone if I need them to be on the phone. And it's only $15 a month. So to me, it's worth it. It's very easy to use to upload and it just goes. I've never had any issues with it. 
um, if you use the code word life, you can get a free month for free. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> little plug for myself right there. <laughs> So I wonder, my work fo focuses on words, the secret spells of the English language, and the sacred path words, and its hidden philosophy <coughs> in, in puns and the symbols of the alphabet. And it also introduces obscure words that can expand our sense of human possibilities. So I wasn't quite sure the difference in what the two of you offer and where might be a better fit for me. Well, he's the weather guy. Um, <laughs> she's, she's much better than... <laughs> Kirk, Kirk works for KTLA, the news station. He does the weather and also the nightly news. You're on all last week, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and he's also a real estate agent here in the area. She's the... I do, I do the podcast She's the more pitching. important person. No, no. <laughs> she's the much more important person to talk to for your, spreading no, so your business. My business is actually <laughs> podcast PR. I do podcast pitching for clients. So everything that's in the book, I do for clients. That is my business. And your business sounds, I mean, your um, subject matter sounds incredible. And I could see it, you know, being, you know, it has, it has great synergy with social media and, and podcasts and especially video podcasts where you could see the words too, I yeah. would say. Yeah. It's a lot of a, a neat niche. Yeah. It's had a lot of attention. I bet. Yeah. Thank you. That's cool. I have one more question. Um, I'm actually an author. I have I have a couple books, and it's a brand new area for me. I have a, another um, business as well. But what, in your opinion, what makes a good podcast host? Someone who does their research on the guest. Someone who, like, so for instance, every author that I have on my show, I read the book beforehand, mm -hmm. so I can ask them anything about the book. I, and I will ask them without giving spoilers away. Mm -hmm. Somebody who simply goes in and really does their homework, looks at where have you been? What do you do? And can come up with those questions. I know that some hosts like to pre-write, pre-script their questions. I did my very first episode and I cringe now because I don't find it necessary. As long as you can hold a good conversation, I really think that makes a good host. And for me to hold a good conversation means that I've done my research. It means that I know you before you even come on the camera and we start talking. So that way I at least have some key talking points that I can ask you. I also come at it to be inquisitive. You know, what is it that I want to know? Because if I want to know, then the listeners are going to want to know too. So those are the questions that I ask. And I think that's what makes a good host. And also, I guess if you go back to the great Barbara Walters, you know, people like that, that how did they get that job? And even like, you know, Jimmy Kimmel you know, where they're just, they're just asking questions. But yeah. Yeah. Showing interest. You and know, then I think having a niche as well, a really strong niche because everything is niche now. Yeah. Yeah. What's interesting what you say about Barbara Walters is she used to put her questions on note cards. So you weren't too far off. <laughs> We're back to that. Yeah. Yep, back to that. Well, <laughs> so see, whoever's watching, you know, yeah. uh, <laughs> so you were spot on. I'm ready. <laughs> so don't feel bad that you're ready. <laughs> Anything else? Claire's all we're done. <laughs> Can I just ask, like, yes. like, bold enough to ask, like, what is it, how much does it cost to hire you to help someone in you know, packages? And do you do sure, <laughs> it is on the website, but that's okay. I have so I have retainer clients that are on six or 12 month packages, or I have um, a podcast book tour, and the 12 month is 2000. The six month is 2,500 The and that's per month. And then the podcast book tour is 6,000 and the podcast book tour, we work together for three to four months. And that includes time for me to read your entire book. Every package comes with a branded media kit. So it looks just like your website, fonts, colors, everything. The author kit is expanded because it includes information, facts about your book as well, not just about you. We do a one-on-one -on -one Zoom where I'm asking, it's almost like a podcast interview where I'm asking you questions. I've already stalked you. 
Um, I create a Trello board that is in the book as well. It's an online project management tool where it's like a giant bulletin board with post-its where we have the potentials we're going to pitch and we move them over and take notes of we've sent an email and this is what the outcome is and this is what we related to for an episode. I create a Spotify playlist for you so that way all of your interviews are in one spot. You can share that on your LinkedIn. There's actually a media section um, on LinkedIn that you can plug that into. You can put it on your website for your media press page. Uh, and then pit, we pitch to clients, do all the follow-ups, work with you on the calendar bookings, and then we track them to go live because I said um, not everybody would tell us that it went live. So we will tell you when it went live. We gather all of the information for you. We download a transcript and then we go through the transcript and identify quotes that you've said that we feel would be worthy of putting into a social media graphic, that kind of a thing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That is my goal. My goal is always to do as much as possible. And I also love to look at the competition. What are they doing and how can I do it even more? So that's my goal. Even with the book, you can see. So I do that in business as well. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate you. Yay. <laughs> oh, you do you want them to buy first? You want me to sign first? What? Yeah. <laughs>